Easter Sunday morning. I just want to kind of look at you just for a moment and kind of get in my heart here. All these good folk that I'm preaching to today, there are two things that are eternal. Only two. God's Word and souls. God's Word will endure forever, the Bible says, and so will souls. All of us will live forever. That's wonderful news if you're on the side of the cross. All of us will live forever somewhere. My hope and my prayer is that you will put your faith in the one who was raised from the dead, Jesus. He took our pain. He took our punishment when he went to that cross. It should have been you. It should have been me. We should have gone to that cross for all of our sin. But Jesus went willingly to the cross for us, took all of our pain, all of our punishment, all of our sin upon himself. And when he did that, he appeased the wrath of God. And if we put our faith in him, only in Jesus, he will save us and he will write our name in the Lamb's book of life to be saved. I wonder, my friend, have you made that decision today? It's got to be your decision. It's got to be your decision. That's a picture of Jesus running out of the tomb, and as I said before, he didn't need the stone removed. He could have gone through that wall. But he came out of that grave once and for all, and that first Easter morning, that first Sunday, that's why we celebrate on Sunday, you know. We don't worship on Saturday anymore like the Jews do. We worship on Sunday because this is the day that commemorates Christ rising from the dead. And so Jesus comes out of that tomb, and the first people to go to the tomb are the women. And if you're going to build a report or to build a new religion, in that day you wouldn't have wanted to build it on women because their testimony was invalid in a court of law. It shows to me the veracity of this story is that these disciples pinned what they heard. They pinned what they saw. And they knew that these women had gone to the tomb first to see this resurrected Jesus. So Jesus was raised from the dead. I want to tell you that if he wasn't raised from the dead, you could have slept in this morning. I mean, there's no use coming to church if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. But Jesus was raised from the dead on that third day so that we, too, could be resurrected. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians 15. If you've got your Bibles, open up there to 1 Corinthians 15. I've entitled this message, By This Gospel You Were Saved. By This Gospel You Were Saved. So 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul writes this to us, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Reading from the New International Version. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word today. I want to tell you, this chapter is not particularly about the resurrection of Christ, although that is foundational to the resurrection. It's about your resurrection and my resurrection. So this is your future we're talking about here. This is your story. This will happen to you. This is very personal. This looks ahead to what the Lord has prepared for them that love him. All of those who love Christ will rise from the dead and will be given glorified bodies. We will be persons, not ghosts, 
persons, as we see in the transfiguration of Moses and Elijah. This is the promise of the Word of God. Christians don't believe in reincarnation, some endless cycle where you come back as a human being or a bug. We don't believe in annihilationism, such as some religious teach. We don't believe in soul sleep. Although you see R.I.P. on tombstones, rest in peace, we don't believe in soul sleep. Paul said to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. We're with him. When you take your last breath here from this oxygen and you go to heaven, your next breath will be from heaven's oxygen. You're in the presence of the Lord, paradise. We believe that after death, we will live. We, we will live as spirits, but we will be joined to our bodies and forever will be like Christ, an eternal spirit living in a resurrected and eternal body. This is our hope. This isn't as good as it gets. I was at the nursing home the other day visiting with a, with a lady, and she's here today. Not the nursing center. She's at the rehab center, Miss Betty Clift. And a nurse came by, and, she, and I said hi to her, and she was talking with Betty a little bit, and I said, you know, I'm just excited that this is uh, as bad as it's ever going to get for me right here on this earth. She said, oh, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm a believer. This is as close as I'll ever get to hell. This is, in a sense, hell on earth for Christians. But for those who are not Christians, this is as close as they're ever going to get to heaven. Can you imagine if this is as good as it's ever going to get, all the pain, all the suffering, all the cancer, all the death, this is as close as we'll ever get? That'd be awful. But I want to tell you, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, this is as close to hell as we'll ever get. Because our home is heaven when we leave this earth. This was very important to the people living in the ancient Greek world with all kinds of mockers believing in dualism. This belief that the spirit was good and matter was bad and the ultimate end of all people should be the complete deliverance from all things material so that you would end up as a floating spirit living in a spirit world. That's what they believed. The, the Greek thought was that matter is evil. Flesh and blood is evil. Our spirits are good. So therefore, Jesus didn't really have a body. This is docetism, this false teaching, this heresy that taught this that Jesus didn't really have a body, he was a phantom. And that his, his spirit was good because he was God in the flesh. They didn't call it flesh, they called it in a spiritual realm. And so they called it dualism. And, but Jesus didn't teach this. In fact, whenever Thomas, who doubted, came to see Jesus in his resurrected form, Jesus said, come and touch me. Put your hand here in my side. And Thomas bowed down and clasped his feet and said, my Lord and my God. He didn't grab a ghost. He grabbed Jesus. We will have resurrected bodies. I don't know how all that works. It'll be, a, it'll be something more than we can understand with microscopes and that doctors can understand with science. We will have a new body, a glorified, maybe, I don't know what, a new metaphysical body that we'll have with maybe more than three dimensions in heaven. Maybe there are 14 dimensions in heaven. We just know this, that the, that the eye has not seen, the ear has not heard, the mind cannot conceive what God has prepared for those who love him. And one of these days, if you put your faith in Christ, one of these days you're going to experience this new heaven that God is preparing for us even now. Jesus went away to prepare a new place for us. Are you going to go there? Do you have confidence that you will be in heaven with Jesus? Not just wishing, not just hoping so, not a hope so faith, not a, not a I think so faith, but a no so faith. I know that I know that I know. Do you know that when you leave this earth, you will be in heaven? John wrote, I write these things to you, brothers and sisters, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Knowledge. Do you have knowledge? Christianity teaches something very different than that, than the message of the New Testament, is that you will live forever, but you will not live as a disembodied spirit. You will live as a resurrected person. Jesus said, because I live, you will also live. His resurrection is the guarantee of our resurrection. He is the first fruits of those who slept. He's the first fruits. He's the first one to be raised to life and to never die again. Now, there were others that were raised. Lazarus was raised, but he died again. Jesus died once and now lives forever. We die twice, and we live forever. We're born twice, and we live forever. We die spiritually to ourself, and we die physically to live for him. 
1 Corinthians 15, 1. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel. I want to focus on that just for a second. The gospel. Gospel just means good news. It's good news. How many of you need some good news today? Raise your hand. You need good news? Have I got a deal for you? You are in the right place. I've got a whole boatload of good news for you this morning. If you need some good news, you're in the right place. Paul said, I preach the gospel. I preach to you which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. The gospel. The gospel. Before I start, if, if this was a room of skeptics, if all of you maybe were mm, maybe agnostic at best, skeptical, wondering about this whole thing about God, maybe you're a little skeptical, and you were saying to me, well, tell me about this. I'd say I've got some terrifying news for you. I've got some very troubling news for you. In fact, it's, I think it's some of the most terrifying words in the Bible for you. I don't know if I want to tell you, but I will. These words that are in the Bible that are so terrifying are this. God is good. You say, wait, what, what do you mean? Why is that terrifying? Why is that so troubling? Well, because God is holy. God is righteous. God will not tolerate sin. God is so good that he cannot even look upon sin. God took Jesus, his son, and put sin upon him and crucified him. And some would even say he turned his face away from his son. And Jesus cried out from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So the most troubling and terrifying news is this, for you, God is good. You say, well, why is that so bad? Because we're sinners apart from Christ. And God can't tolerate us in his presence. The most terrifying news for a skeptic is that God is good. You say, well, what do we do? You can't do a thing. You can't make yourself good. I can't either. You can't help enough old ladies across the street during rush hour to make God love you. But God, in his own righteousness, sent Christ to this earth to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's the good news of the gospel. So it doesn't have to be terrifying news for us. Verse 2, by this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. If you hold firmly to the word. If you hold firmly to the word. I was talking to a fellow the other day and talking to him for quite a while. He didn't know what I did. I knew what he did. And we're talking and, man, he was just letting these four-letter words go and he was just talking to me. He didn't know me from Adam. He's talking, and after a while, as he's talking, throwing all these curse words out, he says, and what do you do for a living? And I said, well, uh, I'm a pastor at Brockington Road Church of Nazareth. And he went, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I want to tell you, he found Jesus just like that. I mean, I tell you, he was quoting Bible verses after that. He was just talking. He was talking about the Lord. He said, oh, my, my uncle's a pastor, and I tell you what, John 3.16, that's one of my favorite verses. And I was like, that's great. And, and we began to talk some more. He said, you know, I've really had a rough life. And he just kind of went in. And it kind of became this, this wonderful God appointment. And I just listened to him for probably 30 minutes as he just shared with me hurts that he'd gone through in his life. And as he was talking about that, I was just thinking about, you know, it's one thing to say you're a Christian, but it's another thing to live as a Christian. That's why it says, by this gospel you were saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. It's not just saying, oh yeah, my uncle was a preacher. I'm in because my uncle was a preacher. He's got enough righteousness all over him. That'll rub off on me and I'll get in. No. No. You don't get into heaven because your uncle's righteousness. I don't either. We all get in by the righteousness of Christ. And if you put your faith in him, then his righteousness now becomes yours. It's the best transaction in the universe. Jesus takes all of my sin, my smut, my sin, all of the gross stuff that I've got, my iniquity, my wickedness. He takes that from me, and the great exchange is he gives me all of his righteousness. And we get to be set free to live forever with him in heaven. That is good news, my friend. So this fellow, as I talked with him, and I gave him my card, and I said, hey, if you ever want to talk, I'd love to talk with you more. And he said, you know what, I am going to keep your card. He said, my wife and I aren't doing that great. We've got, we've got a couple of kids, and 
they're kind of being disobedient and we're kind of getting frustrated with them. And I said, well, just whip them. Just whip them hard. I mean, every day. No, I didn't. <laughs> I want to tell you that, that daddy needed to be whipped, just like I needed to be whipped to get into Jesus, in a sense. It's not whipping you in, but it's the, it's the love of God. It's the goodness of God, Romans 2, 4 says. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And so I tried to, to give to this man, this young man, the goodness of God and talk to him about the gospel. And I thought, boy, I sound crazy to him because he told me his uncle's a preacher. But I went ahead and I told him the gospel anyway. Because I thought maybe he didn't take on the first time. Just like maybe he didn't take on me the first time either and I needed to hear it again. Maybe you need to hear it again today. I want to tell you that you never... Never, 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 never forget that the gospel saves you all your life. It's not a one-time thing. You need the gospel today just as much as you did on the day you got saved. Never forget that you need the gospel today. I never outgrow the gospel, and neither will you. You need the gospel when you're 60, when you're 70, when you're 800. You need the gospel every day of your life. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. Well, pastor, I made a commitment when I was a little kid. Doesn't that count? Well, if you're not living with Jesus, if that was just verbal commitment, it doesn't mean anything. That doesn't count. You must walk with him. You must walk with him. Paul talks about this a lot. He says, those who confess Christ must turn away from wickedness. You mean I can't cuss like a sailor and get in? Well, it's not about the words. It's about your heart condition. It's not about your outward sins. It's not your outward sins that are sending you to hell. It's our rejection of Jesus that sends us to hell. But when you receive him, he pardons you. Jesus said, if you, if, if, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's one thing to know him up here. It's a whole other thing to live him right here in your heart. And you know, you know, You look at your own heart. You know whether you're really living for him or not. You know that. Every high thing must come down. Every stronghold must be broken. Now, I'm not going to say that if you're smoking before you get saved and you get saved, you come to the altar and you get saved, that the cigarettes are gone forever. That that may be a process for you. But some people are delivered right away from smoking. Some people just give it up. But it's not about the smoking. It's not about the cigarettes. It's not about the tar and the nicotine. It's not about that. It's not about the tobacco. It's, does something or someone else have control of my heart? It's not about cussing. That's no big deal. That is a big deal, but it's not that. It's it's not about sexual immorality. It's not about pornography. That's bad, but that's not the issue. The issue is, is that Jesus doesn't have control of your heart. Every high thing must come down. Every stronghold must be broken. And it sometimes takes a little while. That's okay. Stay in the way of the Christ. Stay in that process. Don't give up. Don't say, well, I'm not perfect. I can't do this. I'm giving it up. I'm hanging it up. Don't do that. You're on the way. You're saying, Lord, I want to follow you. Lord, this is stronger than me. This, 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 has, this is a stronghold in my life. Cigarettes, nicotine, <laughs> gambling. It doesn't matter what it is. Pornography. Just confess it to him. Don't try to hide that. Just say, Lord, this is stronger than me. I can't win. But God, I'm trusting you and the gospel. I'm putting my faith in you. Would you come and let every high thing come down in my life? Let every stronghold be broken in my life. That's the power of the gospel. See, this is not a dead religion. (laughs) I'm I'm not trying to tell you about the tooth fairy here. I'm telling you about the person, God in the flesh, Jesus, who has the power to take down every stronghold in your life. If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then, it's an if then, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's where freedom is, holding to his word. What is the gospel? Imagine a fourth grader comes in here and stands right here and kind of yanks on my coat, says, pastor, pastor, what is the gospel? And I turn to you and I say, can you guys help me out? How would you define the gospel to a a fourth grader? What is the gospel? What is the gospel? If you don't know, just quote John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. 
We're bad. No hope. He sent his son Jesus to come and die for us in our hopeless state to save us from our sins. There it is. That's the gospel in a nutshell. John 3, 16. Paul defines it right here, verses 3 and 4 of, the God, of, of 1 Corinthians. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Everything's based on the Scriptures. Now, when Paul's quoting this, is he quoting from Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? The Scriptures, you know. What Scriptures was Paul talking about here? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John weren't written yet when he wrote <laughs> Well, what are the scriptures of the Old Testament? You can be able to look in the Old Testament and find Jesus. Look through the Old Testament and come to Jesus. Look for the Messiah in the Old Testament. He, was, he died, he was buried, and he rose. And now he lives forever to make intercession. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Who believes. So Jesus appeared. Look at verses 5 through 8 with me again. Open your Bibles again. Look at 5 through 8. We're going to go through these. We're going to tiptoe through here. Verse 5, and that he appeared. We can stop right there. Wait a second. You're saying Jesus was dead, put in the tomb, sealed all this legion of, of guards to watch over him. Pilate makes sure this is all done appropriately and properly. And you're saying that Jesus rose from the dead and he appeared? You can stop right there. Whoa, Jesus appeared. That right there should send chills down your back. Jesus appeared in the flesh to people. Look at all these people he appeared to. He appeared to Peter. That's interesting. Paul writes that first. He appeared to Peter. What did Peter do? He denied Christ three times, didn't he? He appeared to Peter. And then to the 12. But it wasn't really the 12, because two of them weren't there. Judas had hung himself. And Thomas wasn't there. But he appeared, and then later he appeared to all of them. Verse 6, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. More or less, Paul is saying, hey, if you don't believe me, go check it out. You can go talk to them with your vocal cords, and you can listen with your ears as their vocal cords move, and you hear the sound waves come back to your ears. You will hear them in the flesh talking to you. They saw Jesus raised from the dead though some have fallen asleep. That means they've died. Verse 7, then he appeared to James. That's the half-brother of Jesus. Then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Now, in the Greek, this word means either miscarriage or abortion. He says, I, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. Miscarried. Aborted. In the sense that God had to raise Paul from the dead too. He was going the wrong direction. He thought he was doing good things. He thought he was doing righteous things. And God had to knock him down on the way to Damascus and reveal himself to him. And Paul took a 180-degree turn and went toward Jesus. So he appeared to Paul, to, to Paul as well. I have a question. Has the Holy Spirit made an appearance to you in your life? I remember sitting in a church service and I remember hearing the gospel. And I remember thinking, that's for me. I'd heard it many times in my life, but I'd never appropriated that to my own heart. I could tell you the gospel intellectually, but I could not tell you the gospel experientially. And I remember sitting there in that service as the word was preached. And I remember standing up as the songs were sung and they gave an altar call. And I remember my heart just began to pound. I was thinking, what's going on? I've been in church all my life. What's so different about this? It was the Holy Spirit coming and bearing witness to my heart that I needed to repent of my sins. And maybe you're here today, you say, well, I think I'm a Christian, but has the Holy Spirit come to you and spoken directly to your heart, not your mom, not your dad, not your uncle, but to you. And he's spoken to your heart and he's knocked on your heart's door. He said, hey, I want to have a relationship with you. If he hasn't today, today could be the day. It's, it's as simple as you saying yes to Christ and what he's done for you on the cross. These eyewitness testimonies, Jesus appeared to many individuals. He appeared to several small groups. He appeared to over 500 at the same time. Jesus was seen alive by multitudes after his resurrection. I think the greatest proof for Rome, the Rome, Roman Empire, the powerhouse of their day, they, they would be probably even greater than the United States is today. They were the powerhouse of their day, the Roman Empire, 
All they had to do to shut all this stuff down was produce the body of Jesus. All would have shut down. They just go, here he is, here's his corpse, shut up, we got him. But they couldn't. The whole Roman Empire, their CIA, their FBI, all of their strategic people couldn't find the body of Jesus. And I bet you they hunted. I bet you they searched. I bet Pilate said, let's lay this thing down. Go and find it. Just go find the body, guys. But they couldn't find his body. Why? Because he was resurrected. <laughs> Went and heard Lee Strobel. My wife and I got to go hear Lee Strobel over in Little Rock a month or two ago. Uh, Got the tickets from my dentist, thanks to Courtney Golden, thank you. And uh, got to go hear Lee Strobel, who wrote The Case for Christ and helped produce the movie The Case for Christ. And as he was talking, you know, he was a, he's formerly, a, he worked for the Chicago Tribune. He was an investigator. And his wife got saved. And he was an atheist. And he was like, this is a bunch of craziness, wife. What are you doing? And he said, no, Jesus is real. He's spoken to me. I, my sins have been forgiven. And Lee Strobel said, well, I'm, yeah, that's nice. Pat her on the head. I'm going to prove you wrong. And so Lee Strobel took several years to investigate the claims of Christ with his investigative mind. And he said, I was savage about it. I'd go to Christians and I would just try to bully them into corners. and I'd try to pin them to the wall with my intellectual prowess. But he said, as I studied the scriptures, and began to study forensic evidence as much as we had today, he said, I began to see, wow, these claims are a lot stronger than I thought they were. And his heart began to be softened, and his, heart, his wife kept praying for him, and this little crazy preacher named Bill Hybels up in Chicago kept praying for him. Now part of Willow Creek Church, huge, thousands of members. They're praying for him, and one day, Lee Strobel said, you know, as I was reading this, 500 people saw him at the same time. He said, you know, I have, I've had dreams before. He said, can you imagine me waking up from a dream and saying, hey, honey, I had this dream. Tell me what it was. And she tells me what my dream is. Or we have the same dream on the same night. Or if they're me and, and our daughters and my, and my wife, we all have the same dream on the same night. It wouldn't even be possible. How would we all have the same dream on the same night? And yet 500 people saw Jesus alive together. 500 people don't hallucinate the same thing. They're going to hallucinate different things. Okay, 420 for some of you. You know, I mean, some, you hallucinate different things at different times. No, this is not hallucination. This is Jesus appearing to them. And so Lee Strobel said, you know what? The evidence kept mounting. Kept, he said, I was going to follow the evidence wherever it led. And, and I kept following that evidence. And the more I followed that evidence, the closer I got to the empty tomb. Jesus wasn't there. And he said, you know, for me, it would have taken more faith to hold on to my atheism than to follow Christ. He said, so one day, I made it public. I gave my life to the Lord in our home, but then went to church there at Willow Creek, and they had an altar call, and I went forward, and I knelt down there, and the church surrounded me and prayed for me, and I was welcomed in as one of the family. This mind, who I'm sure he is a, he is a genius. I'm sure his IQ is well over 140. And he had to go through all of these mental gymnastics to get to the point of saying, you know what? It's going to take a step of faith. You can, you can work all the numbers, math, science. You can do astronomy. You can do chemistry. You can do all these things. Chemistry, if you're Adam. You can do chemistry. You can do all those things. But until you take that step of faith, you're never going to see. See, it's not, I'm, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. It's, I'll see it when I believe it. And that's the difference. You've got to take a step of faith. Every person, every man, every woman, no matter what your intellect is in this room, every one of us have to take a step of faith because the just shall live by faith, not reason. Reason is there. Keep your reason. Keep your intellect. But you've got to have faith that comes alongside your reason for Christ. Jesus did rise. We believe in this resurrection. Salvation requires that. Salvation requires that. Did you know that? Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. The redeemed church is the first witness to bodily resurrection. Resurrection faith is absolutely unique to Christianity. 1 Corinthians, these last three verses, Paul says, For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, but I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect which means his grace is here in this room right now, just like there's Wi-Fi signals going through this room right now. If you don't have your phone tuned to that, to receive that, to receive your Wi-Fi, you can't get the Wi-Fi connection. 
It's passing through this room, but you don't have connectivity. When you connect to the Wi-Fi, then you've got connectivity. You can now use the Wi-Fi. You can use the Internet. Same thing here. God's grace is in this room. It's passing by every heart in this room. But unless you connect to His grace, you can't receive the benefits of Jesus Christ. Have you connected to Christ today? He says, no, I've worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. This is what we preach. We were both just waiting. I was waiting for something yesterday, and there's another fellow waiting. We're just waiting together in a waiting room. And this guy's talking to me about all this stuff, and we are talking about NCAA basketball, and my team, Rock Chalk Jayhawks, choked yesterday. We were talking about all this, and I didn't brag at all because I hate to lose. It was a beat down. Anyway, uh, so we're sitting there, and he's talking to me about all this, basketball, and he told me he used to be a baseball player for the Chicago Cubs, single A, back in the 60s, and he traveled, and he said, I could hit everything. I got down there, and this one pitcher had this curveball. He said, man, they sent me back. I was done. <laughs> I could not hit a curveball to save my life. And so he was done, but he's talking about all this stuff. And then he was talking about his kids. Then he was talking about these other things with cars. And I thought, I'm reading this guy's mind right now. Because from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What do you talk about most? What do you talk about most? And I thought, you know what? What's most important to me? I could talk about KU for a while. That's a lot of fun. I love Kansas Jayhawks. But you know what? That's not most important to me. And I thought, you know what? What's, does, does he know what's most important to me? If he's, if he's analyzing this conversation the same way I am, does he know what's most important to me? And I thought, he doesn't even know yet. And so I said to him, I said, hey, I just want you to know that I came down here from Missouri about four years ago, and I said, I love this place. Awesome people, beautiful state. Arkansas would be great if they could win some football stuff. I said, I'd love it more if they would. And he said, oh, it's been a long time. Been here 60s, I think. I said, I understand. I said, I'm rooting for him. But I said, you know what? I came down here to be a pastor, to see people saved. And I said, I, I want to ask you, are you right with the Lord? He goes, oh, yeah, 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 I'm right with the Lord. Talk with him some more about that. And I thought, well, you know what? At least now he knows that Jesus means something to me. But this resurrected Jesus should be alive in your heart. People should be able to listen to you and hear that you love Jesus. But if you never talk about Jesus, that maybe you've never experienced the resurrection life of Jesus yet. Maybe you're religious, but you're not saved. Maybe you're churched, but you're not a Christian yet. Maybe you know about the things of God, but you've never experienced God himself yet. And this morning, I'm offering you a very simple invitation. Would you like to come and know him? Would you like to receive Jesus as your Savior today? The so what? I was listening to Francis Chan one day, and <laughs> he's a funny preacher. He's good. He's funny. He's talking about so what? So what? He said here, he was talking about it. This is several years ago. He had an Easter message. He said, you know, there's going to be a lot of people there on Easter, and what am I going to say? What am I going to say? Oh, it's going to be the big crowd. What are we going to say on Easter? Everybody comes to church on Easter. And he was led to a passage in Mark where it talked about Jesus had this great big crowd around him. And he began to talk to them in a parable. He began to talk about seed being thrown out. Some falls on rocky soil. Some falls on thorny. Some among the hard path. Some, the seed goes on fertile ground and it produces 30, 60, or 100 fold. And then Jesus walks away. This big crowd, they're all around him. And the disciples are like, okay, Jesus, really give it to him. This is your chance. This is Easter. Give it to him, Jesus. Give him the big message. And Jesus tells him a parable, and all the people are going, what's he talking about? And Jesus just walks out. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Like, hey, guys, Brockington Road, listen, great news. We've got Jesus. He's going to speak to us this morning. Jesus, come on up. We all give him a standing ovation. He comes up, and he, there's a man who went out to throw some seed on the ground. And he tells this parable, and then he goes, and he walks out, and we're going, Jesus, come on you got to razzle-dazzle us a little bit. Come on, Jesus, give us something to leave here. We want to invite all the people. That's not going to draw people back when you're telling parables. They don't even understand what you're talking about. It's, it's, it's interesting. His disciples asked him what this parable meant afterwards. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God have been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. 
If I would give to you a parable of the gospel, I would say those of you who have ears to hear lets you hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Some of you are as dead as doorknobs. <laughs> so was I at one time. Until the grace of Jesus came to me in the form of the gospel and so illuminated my mind and my heart that I couldn't help but come to Jesus. And I can't force that with you. Some of you are looking at me like I have three heads. But I want to tell you, if you don't know this Jesus we're talking about, you're going to walk away scratching your head saying, this doesn't even make sense. Why do people wake up on Sunday morning and go to church every week? What's the use? It's boring. What, what? It's because you don't know Jesus. When you know Jesus, you get hungry for spiritual things. And you want to be here. Hungry people eat. If you only get one meal a year, you're starving through the year. But when you have regular diet on God's word, you grow, you strengthen in your walk with him. Question in closing, why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ important? The answer, number one, the resurrection witnesses to the immense power of God himself. To believe in the resurrection is to believe in God. That's number one. Number two, it validates who Jesus claimed to be, namely the Son of God and Messiah. According to Jesus, his resurrection was the sign from heaven that authenticated his ministry and the proof that he had authority over over even the temple in Jerusalem. Number three, his resurrection proves his sinless character and divine nature. The scriptures said God's holy one would never see corruption. And Jesus never saw corruption even after he died. He was raised. Number four, the resurrection also validates the Old Testament prophecies that foretold of Jesus' suffering and resurrection. If Jesus Christ is not resurrected, then we have no hope that we will be either. In fact, apart from Christ's resurrection, we have no savior, no salvation, and no hope of eternal life. And lastly, Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, Jesus led the way in life after death. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is important as a testimony to the resurrection of human beings, which is a basic tenet of the Christian faith. Unlike other religions, Christianity possesses a founder, Jesus, who transcends death and promises that his followers will do the same. Every other religion was founded by men or prophets whose end was the grave. As Christians, we know that God became man, died for our sins, and was resurrected the third day. The grave could not hold him. He lives and sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Amen, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah. I mean, we, we've got a great Savior. I want to tell you, by this gospel, you are saved. You're not going to get into heaven any other way. I wish I could tell you a different way. But by this gospel, you are saved this gospel? Have you experienced Jesus in your life? Do not be amazed at this, Jesus said, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. We're all going to be resurrected, whether you're an evil guy or a good guy. You are going to be resurrected. Those who have Christ will be resurrected to heaven. Those who don't have Christ will be resurrected to eternal damnation. This, my friend, is the gospel have you received the gospel today? Here's the big, long preacher's finger. <clears throat> what about you? What about you? This is where we pray that the Holy Spirit will so convict every heart in this place. Saints, begin to pray that, that every person in this place, will be, Christians will be convicted about sin, that unbelievers will be convicted about their need for Christ. This is where I'm pointing at every one of you. I could have you and me in front of me, one on one. I'd point, what about you? 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 Are you saved today? Are you going to go to heaven when you die? Are you saved today? There's an older lady that talked to me last week and said, Pastor, we're going to have a good one next week. We're going to have a good sermon next week. I was like, what? Do you think I'm going to give you a bad one? She's like, she's like, well, no, I mean, you know, I'm going to have some family in and, you know, you want to give them the goods. Here are the goods. Do you know Jesus? There's no better time than now. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. It's appointed unto man once to die, and then after this, the judgment. But if you go into that eternity Without the covering of Christ, you will face a terrible, awful judgment of God. 
But if you receive Christ, He covers you. He makes atonement for you so that you may have His life in you. Jesus, how's it going? We doing okay down here, Jesus? Have I told Him what you wanted me to tell Him? <laughs> 